Hi, everybody. Welcome to the symposium webinar for the leadership students here at the Institute. Uh, guys, sorry I'm late. Uh, first off, uh, SoCal traffic is kind of crazy sometimes, um, and uh, I didn't estimate, so sorry about that, but we'll make it up to you and all that stuff. Um, great, great topic today, and I'm going to start with a thought question for you, and we'll go into it. But here's the, here's the question. What do you do when relational problems don't really work or don't, aren't, 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 aren't fixed and it creates performance problems? You know, I'm a student of, of, of Peter Drucker, the Moses of management, and one of his greatest statements that never, never, never left my head was that culture will eat strategy for breakfast meaning culture, relationships, how people engage. You can have the greatest strategy, greatest product, greatest marketing plan, and I've seen it all go down in flames in billion-dollar companies because people don't understand culture. So I want to give you the skills today of how to deal relationally with people and the different ways you're doing this in the different places you're in the office. The, the reason that I like this, this talk is because it's not very ethereal or very um, pie in the sky or 30,000. You need the conceptual stuff sometimes. But I want to just kind of take you, walk into your business with you and go into several areas that you work in. <coughs> Sorry. And you'll think to yourself, I had that meeting, and here's how you can have that meeting differently. And it's all going to be used, all going to be what I call your relational skills. You know, we are really happy that one of the things at the Institute is that we teach you not only performance skills, but at relational skills, because a lot of programs that deal with this content, uh, MOL, MBA, they teach you the performance stuff, but you don't get this stuff. And this is critical stuff. The research says it. So this is going to be a fun time, and you'll learn a lot of stuff. So look in your handout that you got. And as you see here, we're going to start off with um, the first con the, the first. I don't know, get together with people, I guess. It's going to be team meetings. I mean, goodness gracious, team meetings. We all have team meetings where you got to get together for that Monday meeting where you, everybody's all hands and they want to sort of like, uh, no, this isn't all hands. This is more like key people like your C-suite or maybe your sales team or your finance team or your marketing team. And how do you use relational skills? Because most people only use relational skills to solve a problem. Well, guess what? You can do this proactively with some of these tips and techniques I can give you to make those things work better. So what is the purpose of a team meeting? I'm just going to review this. Most of you know this, hopefully by now in your pro pro program. But a, a team meeting is about reporting on goals and progress and the and craft and performance accelerants like how do we do this better and faster? What's the incentive for that? Address the challenges. All right, here's some of the skills I want you to use and start using at least, you know, in your head as you're putting this together, as well as in the businesses and organizations and churches you'll be in. Facilitate interaction instead of learning. Interaction, not learning, lecturing. Facilitate interaction instead of lecturing. In other words, interaction is more helpful and more productive than lectures. All of the neurobiology says that, that people kind of go to sleep when somebody's lecturing, and goodness gracious, how many leaders get up and drone on and on about, here's our mission, here's our challenges. Everybody's sitting there just kind of, gosh, I wish I could text here so nobody could notice me. So you be the one that says, what do you think? And here's the, here's the biggest, the best way I can do it. I've structured many country companies this way. Is you start off and say, okay, it's, it's, uh, let's talk about our sales. Um, this is the purpose of this meeting is to solve some challenges and look at some opportunities. And then you just bring other people out. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And some people are going to go, I don't know. I feel like a deer in the headlights. And uh-oh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like I'm waiting to respond to you. But you don't be the leader that's got all these golden nuggets. They'll come in, but you sit back and say, I want to hear everybody. And everybody's got to speak up in the team meeting. Here's what I see. Here's what I think. And, and then say, it sounds like you guys are saying something different, and they'll have to look at each other, and they'll have to talk about why they're different. And, and, and then you, you've got this culture you're developing where people feel okay disagreeing. And then at the end, you say, okay, here's my summary thoughts. You said this. This made sense to me. You said this. Uh, I'm not sure where we are. I mean, I, I want to hear more about this. I'm not sure I want to go that direction. And then you put out your perspective. You don't want to be leaderless, but you want to facilitate interaction. Mm -hmm. Secondly, dig into the soil but, uh, underneath the KPIs. Dig into, and you know, I always talk about this, into the why. 
when somebody says, well, you know, our sales aren't really good, you know, we've got to get on the phones and hit it harder. So, well, before we go into hit on the, hit, get on the phone and hit it harder with outbound sales or whatever, why is that? Um, a lot of times people don't ever think about it. They just think, work harder, um, you know, be, be smarter, get up earlier. And there is a lot to be said for diligence, a lot to be said for perseverance. But guess what, guys? In great companies, that's not always the answer. Sometimes harder is not the only answer. They're working as hard as they can. Sometimes they're just sled dogs and it's still not working. Why isn't it? Well, you find out you've got the wrong product or you haven't trained the people right or you've got people doing too many things or you've got to prune back. So go into the why. The other part is be hard on the issue. I'm really kind of upset and concerned about the fact that our revenues are dropping in the manufacturing department. And this, this is a bad thing, and, and I, I want to hold everybody accountable to, the, to that as well as myself. But I want to be soft on the person, hard on the issue and soft on the person. These are just relational skills where you're never condemning somebody or shaming them or guiltifying them. You're never saying, you know, you're just worthless or I'm so disappointed in you. I mean, you know, you're letting everybody down. You just say, no, you're a great person and I want to support you. But this particular issue, this is a big deal. All right. So that's your team meetings. Make sure that you put that into your team meetings. You've salted and peppered that relational flair, that relational flavor of your team meetings. Second, key leader development. Every great organization is doing more than just making a great widget. They're, they're making great leaders. As the E-Myth book says, which I love, you don't work in the business, you want to work on the business. How do you work on the business? Well, you get out, if you've got that bakery and you love making those cookies, you stop making the cookies and you hire really good leaders who can have people make cookies. That's how you go scale. Otherwise, in 10, 20 years, you're still making cookies. And if, and you know, if you want to, if you want to lead a, a, a lifestyle business, that's fine. You just make the cookies or run a and b There's nothing wrong with a lifestyle business. But if you want to go scale, and that's just your choice, if you want to go scale, you've got to develop your leaders. And here's the purpose. You connect, envision, and clarify. I'm sorry. You build on strengths and mitigate weaknesses. You're a coach, in other words. You develop people. Now, here's some of the, here's some of the skills to use when you're developing people. They go first. When you're sitting down with them, saying, how do you think you're doing? You know, the self-evaluation piece. Don't tell them, well, I think this time you did okay over here. I really want you to work better on being on time. And, you know, you really got to go to this account more. And you're not very uh, organized with whatever. You just say, how do you think you're doing? What you find out is that people are generally harder on themselves than you will be. And if, they, if you go first, they'll just kind of, again, they'll just kind of listen like a, the, the, the kid of an alcoholic. You know, ACA kids know very well, don't say anything until you've read out the parent and, and done the reconnaissance. Then you're happy if they want you to be happy, and you're sad if they want you to be sad, and you're quiet if they want you to be quiet, and you laugh if they want you to laugh. That's how ACAs grow up. A lot of research about that. That's how your direction employees are, too. They're waiting to see how you're spo they're supposed to be, like little scared kids. You don't get any truth or reality out of them. You go first. How do you think you're doing? And they'll be very hard on themselves. And then you'll say, well, that's true about some of this, but you know, there's some other points that I think I want to make sure you understand. You're doing pretty well. I'm really proud of this. Here's the challenge area. So let them go first. And they'll own it more, too. The ownership is huge. They'll go, I said that about myself. I said that I didn't confront my colleague when I should have about how loud they are on the phone or whatever. And I should have. And I'm going to be more courageous and do that. When it comes from in here, it's so much more effective than when you said, here's the three areas of your life. You still got to do it, but it comes second. They go first. Second part is keep the six to one ratio of positive to negative or positive to, to challenge, let's say. I don't like to say negative a whole lot. I do when I have to. It's positive, six times more positive statements than challenge statements. You know, you got to read Henry Cloud's new book, Power of the Other. Wonderful book about how important relationships are in the workplace. And he, he found some research that says really successful people have people telling them six more times a positive thing about themselves than a negative thing. I was floored by that. And I've read similar research. I didn't know it was that high. But uh, the fact is that people flourish when they hear positive. Now, you never just you know, blow smoke and you know, tell them everything's perfect, but more on the positive than the negative. It's just kind of what you know, we've been telling it, you know, we're seeing in our parenting. It's the same thing with employees, directs, people working for you. So that's the second part is use that in your, your key leader development and also give one homework assignment. 
I, when I'm coaching and I'm working with uh, executives, everybody needs a homework assignment. I don't. I, I think I failed if I just leave and say, "Look, it's been a good meeting. You know, see you next month." I want you to work on this. You know, I want you to work on um, uh, making your strategy go into one page instead of twenty pages. I want you to work on um, having a, a, a better team meeting. I want you to work on uh, flying around the country and finding new products. But I always give them one and just make it simple. Just make it something to do. You know. When you're working with your people, they're busy. They're busy doing a lot of stuff. Don't give them like 10 hours or even two hours to do during the week of something you want them to work on in development. One thing. One thing's enough. All right. Um, all hands meetings. Now, what is that? That's the big, well, it says in the purpose part, it's where you uh, connect, envision, and clarify the path. And this is the, the meeting. Generally, have people have it on a Monday if they're off on Saturday and Sunday. And everybody gets together either on video conferencing or in the office or whatever. And you talk about here's what's going on in the company. Just when you get the housekeeping items, here's where we want to go. Here's the big big challenges. There's some things. If you if you run an all hands meeting, which are very very important, very helpful. Here's a few things you can do. One, when you do it, be vulnerable. When you're running that, you be vulnerable. What does vulnerable mean? You talk about your Challenges. And I don't mean I've got a tough life. I mean the challenges that you own. Hey, guys, I kind of checked out last, last month. I looked at and evaluated myself with my board, and I just feel like I really wasn't there. I was preoccupied doing some other things. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to do better. Or I really blew it with the Smith account, and somehow I didn't make it happen. I should have made it happen. That's on me. That vulnerability is wonderful. Some people say that vulnerability is just talking about how mean everybody was to you. And that is a type of vulnerability. It's like when you've been hurt. But there's also the vulnerability of your failure. So a balance of like when it's not your fault and you just feel sad or hurt and your own failure. Two different things, but be vulnerable about it. We found out in the research that the vulnerable leader is, much, is, is somebody people will be much more loyal to and they will follow that person. You know, we've got a problem in our businesses of the revolving door. People are coming in, coming out, but they'll stay longer and be much more productive because there's somebody they can identify with. The Superman, Superwoman, S on the, on the chest leader, People just kind of go, they're not me. They don't understand my experience, and they don't feel loyal. But the vulnerable leader, they'll go, that's kind of how I live. So be vulnerable in the meetings. Anytime you got a chance to be, you have to inspire them. Nobody's inspiring them but you. How do you inspire people? Well, you've got to tell them how passionate you are, your own passion, and you've got to talk about an example. Hey, I think we're going to go here and spend you know, be, be specific. You don't just say, oh, we're going to rule the world. We're going to take over the Acme Staples. Well, what does that mean? Give them an example and also talk about the future. And then also talk about their place. And I want you partnering with me as we go into China and as we take over the welding, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing bolts of the world. I want you with me because you're the best people. You're the team. You're the band of brothers and sisters. You inspire them in these meetings. Always give them three or four minutes of inspiration. Even if things are tough, they, in fact, they need it even more when, when, when things are tough. And then um, problem-solving conversation. This is the sort of like part of leadership that you know nobody wants to do, but everybody's got to do it. That's why Henry Cloud and I wrote the book you know, having the, 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 the difficult conversations that you've been trying to avoid. Um, resolve specific performance and attitude and relational issues that arise. Just a few things about that. I kind of, I get some top tips from that to make it doable for you. Whenever you do this, start, you know what, I think I'm running out of ink here. I'm going to confront myself. I still am nice to myself. I believe in myself, but I, I need a pen, pen here. Let's see how this one works. Here we go. Oh, look at that. Victory is ours. Start with four. Sam, Sally, and I know we've got to talk about this tough thing, but, you know, I want to let you know, I'm, I know we can work it out. I know I'm, so, I'm glad that you're here. I'm very glad we're partnering together. But start with four because when you get ready to have a tough talk, the persecutory judge inside them is already amping up, saying, this is it. They don't like you. They're singling you out. They've got, it, they've got it in for you, and you're going, no, it's not true at all. Start with four. You're neutralizing the inner judge. You know, we talk about the judge a lot in the process times. It neutralizes the judge. It makes, it makes it so they can hear. And determine events instead of patterns. I mean, events from patterns. 
When you're concerned about a performance issue, attitude issue, relationship issue, don't get stuck on one event. You know, one time, one time is just one time. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs, it says that, that uh, you're supposed to overlook an offense. One time is an event. In fact, two times is an event to me. Three times I'm starting to see pattern. So don't go after, you know, you really should have done better on X, Y, Z. Been, been, you know, you're 15 minutes late or you um, didn't get that uh, account done or whatever. Why do you see it three times? Make a big distinction here. Otherwise, you're seen as like, you know, micromanagey and you're just trying to play gotcha with them. And I've, I've had gotcha bosses. It was awful. I, don't want to, I wanted to gotcha to them. So wait till it's a pattern. Again, move to the why. We talked about that earlier. You know, why aren't you performing? Maybe you haven't been resourced, or maybe you've got something going on at home that you really checked out. Maybe you've got a sick kid or whatever, but go to the why, and then give them a practical solution. You know, get your act together, you know, and I can go, Charlie, go. I think you can make it. Well, so what? But practical solutions, try this. I, I, I want you to... Um, since you're kind of like a quiet person, you don't reach out and everybody thinks you're, you're snooty. I know you're not snooty, but you're very passive relationally. I want you, the next 30 days, to walk to other people's cubicles and offices and say, hey, how's it going? Let's get some coffee. I want you to take initiative. In fact, I want you to have a conversation that you have initiated with four people a week for the next 30 days. And I'm going to be checking on that because I really want you to change your patterns. Remember, it's all in the brain. It's all in neuroscience. I want you to do that. Well, I don't do that. I'm an introvert. Well, you're not going to be an introvert anymore. You're going to be an introvert inside, but not. But outside, I'm going to have you just 15-minute talk, five-minute talk, take them out to lunch four times a week. In 30 days, they're kind of a new person, right? That's practical. And then um, client engagements. Well, clients are the lifeblood of any business and of any uh, 501c3, any church, any for-profit. How do you deal with clients? It says the purpose there is to listen to the client and develop trust and commit to improvements. So very, very important because that's kind of where all the action is. Here's some skills. <laughs> no dog and pony show. Oh, my gosh. I love Pat Lencioni. He's a friend of mine. And uh, he talks about how in, uh, in, in, in the, uh, what is it called, the naked, I think it's called the naked executive, if I get the title wrong. He talks about how people would hire him when he was with Bain because when he went in to consult, um, it was such a contrast between other people and other organizations. The big guys would come in and, and make the pitch for consulting, and they'd show 14 PowerPoints and all this, and here's our program. This is going to do for you. You know what Pat did? And he taught me this. He walked in and he went, I just got to listen. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Why do you do this? What's this over here? How does this work? Help me understand this. How does this feel? And they finish up. And he's got the thing. I began doing that years ago because I, would, I was in competition with a lot of other consultants who'd come in and say, we're going to put you through our pipeline. And I went and I said, I don't, my pipeline is very tailored, very contextualized. Let me see what you're doing right. And let me see what the challenges are. And I listened and listened and listened. And to the point that they would say, when are you going to give us answers? I said, when I have enough information. And then it worked out. 90% of the time I got the, I got the gig. Um, deal for the unexpressed negative. You know, when you're pitching yourself and your client wanting them to upsell or be happy or stay with you forever, you don't want them to be unhappy. So you want to say, aren't you great? Aren't you happy with us? We love partnering with you. But what happens is inside them psychologically, they're thinking, why aren't they asking me about the challenges here that they've got one of the people on their team isn't working or we're not happy with what one product or the deliverables are late or whatever. And you say, tell us what the negatives are. I love it when Bill Hybels um, says, go for the last 10%. So everybody says, it's going well, it's a good partnership, we like what's happening with, with you know, as, as your vendor. And he said, but tell me, what's the last 10%? And then somebody will go, well, there is this. Uh, sometimes you guys don't listen well, or sometimes you're not on time, or sometimes the pricing structure's wrong, or the, you know, the RFQs aren't working or whatever. Okay? So you dig for that. And commit to improvements. You know, we'll do this better. We'll do this pricing better. We'll be better on deliverable. We'll, we'll have the right people dealing with it. We'll, we'll listen more. And I always say, two days. We will get you a plan within two days. You're a key customer. You're a key client. We'll get you a plan on what we're going to do in two days, and we're committed to that. And you make that your first priority. They, people, the client is so afraid of, well, it's going to go down a black hole. You're busy. I'll never hear from you again. You'll just, when you're with me, you know, it'll be cool. But when you're not, it won't be. Use these relational skills and say, 
No, we mean what we say. And I'm telling you, the way the business world is working these days, for you to keep a promise on making an improvement and do what you say when you say do it, you will rock. Because they are short, they are, unfortunately, there's less and less and less of those out, out there. That's not you. That's not who you should be. You're an institute grad. So do that. All right. Um, that's our, that's our, uh, our, our didactic, our handout. Really, really practical day. But the point is, don't just work hard and try to make things more efficient and, and you know, stay in late and get there early. Use relational skills. And it's sort of like the oil that makes the machine work. It works so much better. All right. So now we're going to um, have um, a real treat here. For your uh, fellow, you know, we have all these institute fellows. One of the fellows that um, is one of my favorites is a, just a good friend of mine. He's also a coaching client here in Southern California. His name is Steve Perry. And Steve and his wife, Susie, they're philanthropists in, in, in uh, Southern California. They're, they're known worldwide. But they have an organization called sacredharvest.org, sacredharvest.org. And what they do is they vet all these interested entities from, you know, a ministry in the Philippines to poverty in, um, you know, the south, southern part of the United States or whatever. And the ones they believe in uh, on a missions level, the ones that want to be self-sustainable, they fund them. And they're always traveling around uh, evaluating things. Well, here's why this is important. Because Steve understands money and the problems that come with money. He married into a very, very wealthy family. If you know Orange County, California at all, where I'm with, where I am, one of the, one of the uh, families that built Orange County is the Seegerstrom family. The Seegerstrom family had a lot of farmland and they changed it and, and, and developed into a thing called South Coast Plaza, the most successful um, uh, shopping mall in the United States, number one for years, South Coast Plaza. My wife spends way too much money there, but that's a different issue. And, um, but he was going to be a pastor. And so when he, you know, you know, was going to be this great Lutheran pastor who was called to that. He met this gal he fell in love with um, at Azusa Pacific, and they got engaged. He had no idea. She said, my family farms, and he found out what it was. And, and he went into an existential crisis, honestly. He went into a guilt crisis because, as, you, as he says in the book that he wrote, he said, I was trained that, that money is, uh, is sinful, and having a lot of money is sinful, and I wanted not to be sinful. So all of a sudden, he's feeling guilty. Do I have too much? I know you think you can't have too much, but it was really difficult for him. So he came out of it, came with some great, great things he was doing about it. And I encouraged him um, a couple of years ago. I said, um, you got to write a book on this. You have the best biblical conclusions on wealth I've ever seen on what to do about it. So he, he wrote it, and it came out um, recently, and um, you're going to see the, see the book. But, but here's the deal, is you're going to deal with money. You're going to deal with your money. You're going to deal with your organization's money, and I hope your organization has lots of money, and I hope you have lots of money. I want it to be win-win, win-win. But there is a certain amount of tension and guilt and anxiety involved, and Steve has the answer from a personal standpoint, a very, very vulnerable standpoint. It's his life story and a biblical standpoint with practical tips. It is the best book I've ever read on the subject. I wrote the forward to it, and I believe in it. Now, some of his comments are going to be talking about counseling because we also presented this to the counseling students. Um, so there'll be counseling questions or uh, paradigms in there. But there's so much rich content. You need to take great notes on this because Steve is the best guy in the world to help you to work out money for yourself, your organization, and also those you're with. It's a very balanced viewpoint. You're going to love this. All right? So we'll see you after Steve, and um, take care.